welcome to Slayer Fest 98. I'm Ian Carlos Crawford. And I'm Zachary Patton Garcia. I'm Ryan Houlihan. And today we will be chatting with the writers, directors, and a star of Slayers. We've got Christopher Golden. Hi, Chris. And Amber Benson. Tara Hello. McClay! Yes! <laughs> In the house! <laughs> <laughs> So, Amber, I've had you tell your, I always do a Buffy origin, but now we'll do a Slayers origin. Uh, do you want to tell us, like, how it came to be? How it, like, what was the first, what were the first steps in getting this off the ground? Uh, Chris, you want to, you want to help me with this one? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, I feel like there are like 50 different versions of this now. And I've yeah, totally well, I mean, forgotten the, the, how it the, actually the, happened. <laughs> the really short summary is that, you know, um, as, as many people know, Amber and I have been friends for a really long time. Um, and we have our own origin story, but um, I had been uh, talking to Lydia Shama, who, had been at a different company and then moved over to Audible UK um, about other stuff. And she happened to mention to me that they had acquired the rights to do a Buffy the Vampire Slayer audio series. And, um, and of course my response was, well, you know, Amber and I should write that. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and we should write and direct that. Um, and of course, Lydia liked that idea and that's the really short version, but but the reality of it is, and I keep saying this, is that even though they had the rights to do it, um, I really don't think that they would have been able to get the cast to return. I just don't think that ever would have happened without Amber. They just wouldn't have done it, you know. Um, so so that, I think, is the real origin of the thing. I did get out my Rolodex and start making phone calls. You know, uh, the thing that I think people don't realize is that we actually started working on this pre-COVID. Oh, so really? it's been three years in the making. Um, yeah, so I, plus, yeah. yeah. So I remember calling Emma Caulfield three years ago and being like, uh -huh. Hey, we're doing this thing. She's like, okay. <laughs> and then <laughs> I, I would reach out the next year. Hey, Emma, you still down to maybe do this thing? She's like, is this really happening? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> next year she called me, Benson, is this happening? I'm going to shoot something in wherever in Atlanta or wherever. <laughs> I'm not going to be around. What is this happening? I'm like, I think it's happening. I think we're going to do it in the next year. Okay, we're doing this. <laughs> She's like, Are you sure, Benson? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I got on the phone with everybody. And uh, as we were starting to put the uh, outline of the story together, just to make sure that uh, we could get everyone on board ahead of time, because it seems... It seems ridiculous to write a whole thing and then go to somebody and go, hey, you interested? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Much better to be prepared. So I've done a lot of speculating over the episodes and the coverage about like how this came about and who had the idea and who went to who first. So, I mean, we'll take the long story, too, if you ever want to us <laughs> also. <laughs> yeah, well, there were a lot of conversations about we should talk about. I mean, there were a lot of conversations about <clears throat> who look, basically the people who are involved in this are involved in this because um, they wanted we like to them because and we like them, them. <laughs> yeah, because it Fair. was like, who, who did we want to play with really? It's yeah. like, we're going to be in a room with people. <laughs> who, did, who did we want to play with? But also, you know, Amber and I did have a lot of conversations about, um, uh, you know, giving, giving certain characters attention and love and, uh, and, and, uh, adventures that they had never had oh, and maybe writing yeah maybe writing some 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 moments changing those moments uh which is how we ended up with the multiverse sort of storyline is that we wanted to deal with anya and tara and cordelia but because of canon from the show and from uh, other other sources um those characters really weren't available yeah. in the same way. So how do you how do you bring them into the fold? You go to another universe where they still exist, and you give them a whole different storyline, and you you maybe right a few wrongs in the process. You know, it's funny because I mean, sci-fi and comic books and like fantasy have been doing multiverse for a while, right? But they've become more like commonplace. And it's funny that like you just said, you worked you started this three years ago. You know, the, the Marvel movie Multiverse of Madness had not been talked about three Correct. years ago. Um, Correct. And it's funny that like all of, I feel like this kind of stuff in sci-fi and fantasy like ebbs and flows with like 
kind of what works and what doesn't. But I was telling someone the other day, I was like, the original Star Trek did this with like Mirrorverse. And Buffy did it too with, you know, the Vampire Willow. So we've had shows that have done this. And it does make sense in the Buffyverse to be able to do that because it's such a open, you know, you have the like, there's sci-fi elements, even though it's more fantasy. There's, you can do kind of whatever the hell you want, right? Right. Well, whenever magic is involved in a universe or a, or a, a, a story world, I think it gives you sort of unlimited power to try weird, exciting things. But I remember growing up reading Diana Wynne Jones and she was dealing with multiverse theory in her, her uh, Chris Amancy books. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, like multiverse theory has been around for for a very long time. And I mean, um, Michael Moorcock and the Eternal Champion. Yep. You know, it, it was all that. So it's all, but but in the sense of it being for in the forefront of pop culture imagination, when we yeah. came up with this idea and we're originally outlining it, multiverse of madness hadn't come out. Spider-Man No Way Home hadn't come out. Yep. Um, you know, it just was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And for me to have the a, multiverse gravy train, yeah. for, me, for me to have a less uh, like dumber down watered version of, oh yeah, there's been multiverse X-Men. X-Men was always my like introduction to multiverse with like days of future past. And like, I would play that storyline with my toys as a kid because I thought it was so cool. It's like, I could have these characters <laughs> die, but nope. Then they fix it at the end. They go back in time and like fix it. Sure. They go to like a different dimension where everyone's alive. Um, and that was like my favorite thing to play as a kid, just like, oh, someone time traveled and they fixed whatever, or they went to a different <laughs> universe. That was always like fun. And it's like, I feel like it must've been fun for the two of you to play in that kind of world with like, oh, we oh can gosh. do whatever we want. Totally. I mean, that's how we end up with Cordelia the Vampire Slayer, which was a big draw for me and for Chris. Yeah. Um, did Did either of you know that that was like a big thing with fan fiction? No. no. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> To me, it was always so meta because she, you know, Charisma was one of the the like the last handful that tested for Buffy. And I was like, what would the world be like if she had been Buffy instead of Sarah Michelle? Like, yeah. how bananas would that be? That was always <laughs> very intriguing to me to see that world. And so that that was where we were coming from. But I 100% get that the fans would be down for that. Of course they would. I was down for it. Why wouldn't they be? <laughs> But I didn't know that was a fan fiction favorite. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) When it comes to like multiverse stuff, obviously it's so great that it's baked in to the like show and like the world without shrimp and stuff. Like we were really like prepped for this. Um, But when it comes to like actually writing it in the real world, a multiverse means you can really do literally anything. Did everyone sort of come in with ideas of like what they're like in pre-production, what they're like, sense of justice or their unexplored storyline would be because in my mind this is kind of quintessential Anya the multiverse one and Cordelia getting to be the chosen one is kind of like an end of her story on Angel and Tara getting to be dark Tara as opposed to dark Willow is like something that we've all like kind of fantasized about or like thought about or whatever um did everybody have like an idea or did you guys like lay it out in like a grand unveiling and everybody clapped. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember there being applause. <laughs> there should have there, been. Yeah. There now snaps. there will be. <laughs> snaps. snaps. There were snaps. <laughs> um, we actually wrote the whole thing. Uh, all nine uh, episodes were written before anybody else saw it. Huh. Um, so they all received it in, in that way. Uh, while we were recording, we did get some requests for the future. <laughs> mostly, mostly just that everyone wants to have sex with Spike. <laughs> I mean, we've got a few people here too who. When you <laughs> in season two in the shadow the pocket, give it to me in the shadow pocket, and I'm I'm good with that. In, <laughs> in season two, when you write, uh, Spike has to go on a podcast, and he meets Ian, Ryan, and Zach, and he hooks up with three of them. In the shadow pocket, it's again, just an make orgy. sure yeah. the shadow pocket is there. But so then you were talking about your rolodex and like creating the story and. And then like kind of reaching out to people and seeing who would be part of it. Were you writing the story based off who you knew would be in it? Or did you just decide to write the story, reach out to those people? And if they weren't going to be in it, just rewrite that section of it. Mostly we wrote to who we knew was excited and interested. Yep. That's right. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, it, it, like I said, it, it's, it becomes an excessive amount of work when you're writing something in the dark. It's way better to have everyone yeah. sort of, whether they do it or not, just know that there is interest because sometimes people's schedules get funky and they can't do it. But with this, we were very lucky. Everyone was able Who to- Who was a little bit more together. hesitant to do it? I think everybody was a little nervous about it. I was nervous about it, frankly, yeah. you know? Um, Even once there's... we got into the studio, everybody was nervous. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of trauma attached to Buffy. Uh, yeah. for a lot of people and i think you know there was there was a lot of hesitancy of like well do i step back into this world and revisit sort of painful feelings and chris and i and and lydia and and the audible uk team and casey wayland who is our co-director and producer we all worked really 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 hard to make this a safe space that was really important that everybody felt protected and um you know, and I think we we did a a pretty good job of that. I think you know, obviously, you're not going to make everybody happy all the time, and sometimes you know things fall through the cracks. But I would say we did a, a ninety percent ninety percent job of of keeping everybody feeling very safe and protected. That was really important for us. I got to say I, that. I think, oh, go ahead. I was going to say a big element of that too. I think was the fact that we recorded everybody together in the studio, everybody was there, um, except Tony Head, who was in London, but he was even live on screen with us while we were recruiting oh, that. simultaneously. Wow. So I think that part of that sort of safe space atmosphere was the fact that everyone was experiencing it together. Um, and then back to your question of the, the one character, Amber, that I, I know that we wrote in uh, with the the full knowledge that we might have to completely replace was actually Danny. Jonathan. Oh, really? Okay. Um, because, because we didn't know, I mean, it was, it was going to be a, you know, we knew that, you know, you know, Danny loves Amber and, and, uh, and that he was sort of up for it idea wise, but whether he'd be able to do it right. or, or whatever. He's so busy. Yeah. You know. He's so busy. So we were really lucky and he reported Which is why he's not in it much because we were like, yeah. okay, we can, we're never going to get him if we write this long thing. <laughs> anyway. I, it's not surprising though, that Amber, you would be one of the people that gets everyone to come back. Cause I will say, <laughs> you know, we've had numerous people who worked on Buffy on this podcast and everyone's always singing your praises. Everyone's always saying Aww. how nice you are. Everyone's always like, oh, like even if they didn't, they weren't on the show with you, but like <laughs> like uh, Charisma, when I've had her on, you know, you guys became friends doing cons yeah. and stuff. Um, everyone always sings your praises. And I mean, so do I, because I talk, I feel like you just saw this post. I was like, oh, right. Amber can see this. That's embarrassing. But you were my first ever interview I ever did. And Aww. I was so fucking nervous that day. And you were so nice. You were just you like, did it's not okay. Come off, you did not come off nervous at all. Very professional. Um, no, I, you know, I feel like you treat people the way you want to be treated. And I like people being nice to me. So <laughs> I try and treat other people nicely. So they reciprocate. Um, Plus life is short and what is the point of being here and, and yeah. just like being a jerk? Like I, to me, it's, I, if I feel cruddy, why would I want to make anybody else feel cruddy? And I know a lot of people disagree with me on that, but I just, <laughs> Unfortunately. That's, just not how I, that's just not how I roll. So yeah. Well, speaking of the cons, did y'all, so over the years and y'all seeing each other as often as you did doing these cons, did y'all have ideas and talk about continuations in some form? Not really. I think, you know, uh, like I said, there, there's a, a lot of people came away a little damaged. So there was that component. But then I think also, you know, very much we all, for whatever, you know, the guy that created the show, Joss Whedon, whatever his issues, like he is a sing, he was a singular voice. And I think people were like, oh, we don't want to be a part of something that doesn't have that voice. It wouldn't be the same. Um, so I think that was sort of part of it. And then I think it was really nice for Chris and I to come along and kind of prove that wrong and be like, yeah, we're not that voice, but we're a voice that is different and awesome in its own way. And, and, you know, I think that was, that was really neat that we could do that, that we could find our version of Buffy that isn't exactly the same, but is still just as wonderful and awesome and interesting. I love that confidence. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 
I, I'm wondering, like, you know, you have many years in there where I'm sure you all had your own private frustrations and emotional baggage. And it's hard because you want to protect the property that you love, that you made, that like is tied to you. But you also want to be honest and you want to, um, you know, you want to change things. And I wonder if in those years, watching the rights go from Fox over to Disney and then different people, I'm sure, at the company coming in and out. And you've got, you know, executive producers who claim it's their show. You've got the staff writers from the show who claim it's their show. Then you've got the whole Angel thing. Like, then years of fandom. Then you've got, like, Chris right here, who's probably wrote as much Buffy stuff as anyone on Earth. True. Um, <laughs> at what point did you feel like you had some level of control back? Like, you got to, like, like when I saw, for example, when I saw Charisma do a post about this, it felt like a total reclamation of all the work yes. that all these people have put in over the years, especially so many women and so many women's stories and experiences poured into the show. Is there a moment where you were like, okay, this is mine again, or this is ours again? Like we're in some level of control because I'm sure for years in there, you probably didn't feel that way. Yeah. I think what was really hard for me personally to reconcile um, was being able to talk about like how wonderful the show is and how many amazing people I met because of the show while also not being able to talk about any of the other stuff for years and years and years. Now I can be honest. Um, and I think the thing that I realized with, with the freedom of being honest is that I was wrong always. It was always a great show because of the collaboration, because it takes yeah. a village to make this show. It is not one person. And it took me 20 plus years to realize that, that this is a, this is a collaborative medium the show is all of us and it does like that's the beauty of the show that's what's so great about it it's the fans it's the people that worked on it it's the people that made it happen like on the executive development you know studio side it is it is all of us together that makes this show what it is it's not one person one person cannot dampen the light of the show and that took me a long time and now i i think with slayers chris and i have made that light even brighter Right, Chris? Well, <laughs> that's, Amber's, that's Amber's way of saying, oh, wait, I'm talking. I need somebody else to talk to. <laughs> um, She's passing it to yeah. you. <laughs> no, I, listen, um, the weird thing for me has always been that I have always been able to do the work that I've done involving Buffy and its uh, associated characters and series in kind of a vacuum. Uh, so even though Amber and I have been really good friends for so long and I, I've been friendly with or friends with a number of other members of the cast and people involved in the show, um, I was always able to sort of do my work um, in a way that was only checked by um, the people who worked inside Fox at the time or right. uh, or what have you. And what was really fortunate about this is we kind of were able to do the same thing here. We were able to kind of go off into our corner and do our work. And yes, people at Disney were, were looking it over and responding. And obviously Audible was um, involved in an editorial way and all of that. But really, we were able to kind of go do our thing. And so when we did get into the studio, uh, it felt like once we had that collaboration with the cast, it felt like it was becoming ours. And by ours, as Amber said, I don't mean just us. I mean, it was ours, the group of people who were in the studio, including the techs, including Casey, the producer. And then when they went to, and, and all the, the, the extras and everybody who came in to do monster and demon voices, everybody who was there, it just felt like we were all there for the same reason. And honestly, like, it felt like we were there. It felt like our reasons for being there were sort of pure in a way with a, with a, with an affection. And yeah. then afterward to get the feedback of people, so many people saying, I feel like listening to this show is giving me permission to love this series again. Um, well, uh, yes. I, I, I just want to say, I do need to say like, 
I'm really happy that you guys feel like that because the fandom for so long, we've been screaming it for so long that this show did not belong to one person. This belonged to everybody who, who created it. It belonged to the fandom. It belonged to it belonged to so many different people that it shouldn't have had to take this long for something to happen or for people to feel like they had yeah. permission or they had any sort of license to continue it in any way that they wanted to because – it is y'all's. It is y'all's. It, it belongs to Emma. It belongs to Charisma. It belongs to everybody who worked on it. And we, as a fandom, received it with with exactly what you were hoping we would receive it with. We we were so excited. We loved the idea that you put forth for it. That that the end of Buffy, right? Uh, the end of season seven left it all open. You know, you can you can do whatever with this world that you want to do. And so for it not to have continued it was a little bit of a crime and it should again it should not have taken this long and I, I really hope that you guys after this feel even more compelled or more excited to continue it in in some other sort of way and just keep it going as long as you can or as long as you want to well we're ready right amber we're, yes, we're ready <laughs> That we're is, ready we yeah. have a stack of fan fiction ideas that like ian just will call me <laughs> to do scheduling and i'll be like ian while i have you okay there's a multiverse of andrews okay? <laughs> it's just all andrew all it's a time. whole universe where andrews. everyone is andrew <laughs> like an ocean's 11 of andrews that's my idea oh my God, that's yeah amazing. i feel like every episode Nothing of our would get done <laughs> <laughs> Nothing would get done. I, I feel um, like every one of our episode coverage, one of us were pitching like, "Ooh, what if what if this was a thing they did?" And like <laughs> thinking of like it was just like us like brainstorming fan fiction. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that was y'all's impact is like putting this out there and then getting everybody excited again to talk about it and to talk about the what ifs of this entire universe that's been left out there and has been ready has been ready to be continued. Well, well, we're just that. waiting for Audible and Disney to to tell us we can. Continue. We are too. We are yeah. too. Audible, <laughs> Disney. <laughs> On that, like now, Disney has a lot of these franchises, but they're certainly not the only company that has like really big universes that people love, and there's lots of stories in them. Those are, um, thankfully, in, in a fun way, it's expanded from just like comic book series into different mediums that do that. Were there any pitfalls, and you don't have to name specific shows because I get it, you don't want to knock anyone else's work, but were there any pitfalls you saw from other series that had expanded that were either things you wanted to avoid or things that you really admired about the way that other shows went about doing um, larger universe material? Chris, I feel like you have you have a lot of, <laughs> Chris always says it just has to be good. Like right? it needs no, to focus is... on being good. Right. Well, the two, my two rules, this right was so funny. It has to be good and it has to stand up on its own logic. And that second one, so many people run into trouble with. Right. <laughs> um, and and that was the thing and working out, you know, working in an audio only storytelling mode means that unfortunately, sometimes the logic has to be info dumped. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we learned a lot of lessons on season one so hopefully we'll have a season two to to explore but um i don't know i can't think of anything in sort of expanded universes except to say that like if you look at i could we could do a whole podcast about the mcu um and the last like two three years of it and sort of pitfalls that they have run into um but i think the number one pitfall is is sort of like people not really paying that much attention to certain things. Yeah. Um, and we were lucky too, because we had, we yeah. had people in the, there were things. So you guys have to understand really quickly to say that like the first episode and even I think the second episode, we took plenty of time to write. And then it took so long to get the green light to Ooh. continue to finish the thing that the, the rest of the series was written very fast. Yeah. So we're in the studio and we've got um, our execs from Audible were huge fans. Um, oh, nice. And we have Juliet in the room. And oh Juliet gosh. has like a, a encyclopedic. A like, yeah, encyclopedic. And so we had like all of these other voices saying, hey, wait a minute, this is wrong. And uh, we need to, this is a, you know, fix this. 
So it was fantastic because we're like in the studio and I'm like, Amber, Amber, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> and we're rewriting little sections as, as we get there because we want to make sure that we get the continuity correct. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, that was one way we were avoiding the pitfalls because we were in a room with people who cared about making it great. Yeah. Is and there anything from the show, speaking of continuity, and I get it, we brought <laughs> in new, like new old characters and stuff. It's, it's all very satisfying, but is there anything from the show that using Tara's unlimited magical abilities, you would retcon <laughs> or change like big or small <laughs> in the original show? Yeah, the original run. Like, is there something from those seasons that you're like, I wish Tara had done that. Or I wish, you know, Buffy had, a, like, you're making your vengeance wish. Is there something you, like, want would change from the original show with your magical abilities? Uh, no death for Tara. I knew you were going to say yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I my gosh. That's everyone's yeah. first. <laughs> no, no, let's lose the kill your gays trip completely from this show. That would be my, my magic there are, wish. There are so many things. <laughs> particularly from the last two seasons that I would do very differently. Um, but it, it, again, we could do like two hours just on that topic. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll have you back on for those two hours on that topic. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but what I will say is that one of the reasons why I'm so hoping that we get to do a second season is because then you will finally see the Tara that, uh, that we intend her to be. <laughs> um I love that. Uh, that this whole story is 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 putting Tara through uh, uh, a a sort of um gauntlet that uh, that ends her up in a in a place where she's very different from uh from any Tara we've ever seen so hopefully we get to explore that um you know, I also have a big, so there are, there's a certain school of, of, of spuffers that hate me because they think that I hate Spuffy. Chris, and we, we usually don't we even bring that up the over here. The <laughs> podcast, <laughs> we deal with this all the time on the podcast. They get really mad at us for critiques of. Yeah, well, they think that I, they think that I hate Spuffy and Amber, I'm sorry, I'm tangenting, but. Um, no, 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 go for it. But like, but, but so the thing is even while we were recording. I had a conversation with James about the nature of vampirism in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer universe. And even James was like, oh man, I never thought of it that way. And, um, but, but basically what it comes down to is I have always said that until he has a soul, that Spike is just a sociopath. Um, and so that anything he does, you know, a sociopath doesn't know the difference between right and wrong, but they model behavior. So anything that he does to appeal to Buffy or any of that stuff prior to him actually getting his soul, he's doing because he's fascinated or obsessed or whatever it might be. But I don't believe he could love at that point personally until he had a soul. And um, and and again, it, it was, he was a sociopath. But just listen to this. If, if Spuffers are listening to this, they're going to be hating on me so hard because of that. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that once he has a soul, he can't be in love. You know, he can't he can't have feelings and all that stuff. But but yeah, so so there are lots of things I would change. I say all the time, if you were watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer and and only ever thinking and invested in her romantic <laughs> life, you weren't watching the correct show. She right. she had a bad picker with men. She like didn't pick something. <laughs> she had a bad so picker. And who just, among us has not? <laughs> watching Buffy, uh -huh. most of us sitting here didn't we weren't it, those were boyfriends. Those were like 18, 19, 20 year old Buffy boyfriends and go who she would be the... now. Exactly. Yeah. She would not be with them men now. So well, also, Buffy... I was also watching for like, I want to know what happened to the Gorch family, you know, like, yes, <laughs> like those are the kinds of things that go through my head. But, you know, you know, that reminds me, I didn't ask you, Chris, because you have never been on before. I'm curious because, you know, I, I read so many of your books back in the day. When did you get into Buffy? I am curious about your Buffy origin. Like, did you did you start watching it from the start and just love it, or? Yeah, you know, it was it was a very uh, it was a very simple thing, which is that um, I happened to be on the telephone with another author named Nancy Holder the day after the pilot aired, and we were chatting, and we had both watched it, and the conversation turned to, "Hey, we should find out if." a publishing company all already has the rights because we should do one of those. And 
over the course of the day, we found out that Pocket, um, part of Simon & Schuster, had the rights to do it and were already in progress. So um, we pitched an idea or we pitched two ideas um, and the, they came back and said uh, they wanted this book, Halloween Rain, which turned out to be the very first Buffy novel. I don't know if you guys know that. It's the very first Buffy. Well, there was a Buffy novel that was a novelization. It was the first original Buffy novel. And they came back and said, well, you know, you can do this if you can do it in six weeks. Um, so we wrote it in four and a half weeks. Um, and yeah, so that's the origin story. And from there, you know. That's wild. I didn't realize that that, that was how like quickly you started. I know like, I feel like most of the ones I read took place in like seasons two, three or four, but I didn't realize yeah. like you started that early. Holy crap. Yeah, it was that's right awesome. after we saw the pilot. And, and the crazy thing is like, we were always in this weird, the, the book series that was being published by Simon Schuster at the time was sort of like a parallel reality to the show because we were always like, we read every episode as they were written. Mm. But by the time a book would come out, like there would be so much more done. So, you know, you could write about something that would be completely con contradicted by the, sh the series and readers would be mad because it was like contradicted in the series, which is like, but you don't understand those episodes didn't exist when we wrote this book. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the beginning. You know, it's funny uh, that you mentioned that because the, I we cover Marvel stuff too on this podcast and we had folks from Agents of Shield on Drew Greenberg who was um Rodan Buffy yeah. was on and he was talking about that how like they kind of wouldn't be in the know about what was the future of MCU stuff and sometimes they would like go to a movie premiere and be like oh shit we need to rewrite this one thing because yeah. now it doesn't make sense with that movie we just saw at the premiere um and it's wild with stuff like that that it wouldn't be like here, just so you know, here are some like future scripts or here are some future things just to keep just it. a heads up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little like look into the future maybe. <laughs> I mean, that's part of why I think the transmedia stuff really needs to be sort of proctored. There needs to be somebody keeping sort of the big book of yeah. so that everybody who's writing in these multiple worlds that are all connected has access to, I mean, we have Google docs, people, come on. <laughs> fine, there's a, I'll and there's do a it. lot. Of, <laughs> yeah, you got us fine. Brian's been pitching this since the beginning. So yes, <laughs> yeah. let Brian be the encyclopedia of Buffy first. Um, <laughs> I, I, well, there is so much Buffy content out there right now. Like there's, they're, they're rebooting with comics there. They have books coming out now. Yeah. Um, this audible series is really the first, like our universe thing that we get to revisit, right? So I something I was always really curious about, especially listening to listening to this, is do they give y'all like a list of things that must be included? Like, do you have to include Sunnydale? Do you or do you just get no. to go wild with your story? Wow, free range. <laughs> well, I mean, that was the cool thing about it is that it really was like, like I said, like we were able to go off into our little corner and do our thing again and that included when we were recording i mean obviously you know disney had to approve the scripts and everything and audible but um but nobody really interfered with the stories we were trying to tell um and you know i want to i want to say too for the record we I said this a little bit when we did our panel at new york comic con i was like amber deserves all her flowers absolutely you know? <laughs> it's like you know all my flowers <laughs> yeah. no i mean it's uh, it really is. It's, it's quite a feat. It's what, well, let me just say, it's quite a feat to completely change the conversation about something from negative to positive and, and to have people feel, uh, feel like some people have actually used the word healed, <laughs> but to have people feel like, um, uh, joy where they, where they'd lost some, you know? And, uh, and I think that's, fantastic and it only happened because of you well no it happened because of you like you, you you were the one that like made this possible you like dragged me into it even when i was nervous about it you're like when well, we can do something good here and i was like i don't know 
I'm biting my nails. Um, <laughs> you were right. We did something. I think we did something really positive with with Slayer's a Buffyverse story. Oh, <laughs> something much more than positive. I can't even describe to you when we all, because we all were listening to it in preparation for this, when we all first turned it on and started listening and like heard the first voices come up and, you know, then there was Spike and there was, you know, Anya and everybody's voice who, who popped up. It just, it, 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 it gives you something as a fan who's invested so much of your life into this. And and the great thing about the Buffy just universe um, is, especially those first seven seasons is as you grow up with it, um, each season applies to a different part of your life that you go through. Right. Yeah. And then it kind of, and then you can revisit it as, as time goes on. Um, but then it kind of does just end and drop off somewhere. Right. And, and then as you, age beyond it and, and go beyond it um you crave more of something and so to be able to have that come back into our lives was just immensely it, it just there's no word to describe it it, it felt euphoric oh i you know i think our our episode so we did episode by episode we did two a week once the series dropped um audible had sent us a few in advance so we recorded those ones um but the first few episodes, everyone, everyone's feedback was, holy crap, like, y'all have never been <laughs> this excited about something, like, the whole time you've been doing this podcast. It is, like, wild to hear the excitement in your voices. I hope y'all didn't <laughs> listen to it, because we were screaming most of the time. I'm pretty oh sure God, we, like, clipped the audio. Well, you know, Ly Lydia, Lydia over at Audible UK is, like, a big fan of the podcast. And I was like, you should come this with us so maybe we'll have to get lydia on because she's listened <laughs> to all of it she knows she's listened to everything and read everything about what slayers has done yeah i mean did. weirdly like i think that lydia may have consumed more coverage <laughs> um than than anyone on earth i mean she has she's read every reddit thread watched listened to every podcast watched every interview like it's crazy. I love that. That's that's really nice to have someone in your corner that is uh, into it, is a fan. Because yep. I've had people who've written IPs who have been like, "This was miserable." The editor had clearly had no like, oh. didn't care about what they were writing for, and like would send back edits that made no sense, and the writer would have to explain, "No, this is in universe. This makes sense." So I feel like that's really nice to have someone who we had the opposite. Lydia was incredible. We were so so lucky to have her, and you know, and Meg just, and Meg Clark, our marketing was, queen. And you know, yeah. we would be like in the middle of recording, and we'd be like, "Hey, Lydia, how do you pronounce uh, Althea?" <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I want you both to know, I was very proud of myself when we were recording. I was like. I can hear Allison Hannigan saying that name. I know it's in the show. And it was, it was, a, you know, it was the show. I was like, I was like very proud that even just the name, I was like, wait a minute. I know that that's a name that's been mentioned. <laughs> well, well, there are of lots like... of Easter eggs in there. <laughs> lots of Easter eggs. Well, speaking of those like Easter eggs and all the continuity. Wait, stuff, should we go like... into, should we tell, say it's going to be spoilers from here on out then? Probably. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, in case your question was spoilery, Ryan. But for anyone okay. listening, if you haven't listened to Slayers, now we will be going into spoilers. This one won't be, but we okay. have to. <laughs> um, with all the continuity stuff and like the little detail work, what really stuck out to me and gave me goosebumps outside of the fact that everyone was back and their voices are perfect and everyone sounds exactly the same and I was screaming. Um, <laughs> other than that, it was that like sound effects some like editing cuts, like the way that the script would cut from a specific word to something funny happening in another scene that kind of resonates. Like there was things about it that were just so, not just inherently Buffy, but like things Buffy kind and Angel were kind of doing first. And I wonder like, was it hard to be like, I, I don't know how much you guys were involved in like the back end technical production, but was it hard to like pull all the punching sounds and like try to like make sure all the quips <laughs> go in the right place? Or did it just come naturally because you're so like, immersed in the world well we got very lucky with casey wayland and his team they are incredible they did such a beautiful job i mean the time and effort that they put into slayers and i don't know if you if you got to listen to it at all in the dolby atmos but they like spent like weeks like prepping 3d models like all-nighters sleeping on the floor of the studio yeah but like they were prepping like where people where characters were standing like within the dolby atmos because 
it's, I mean, it's incredible. And it's like, they, there's like a whirlwind effect at one point and this spinning vortex. And they were like plotting that on this 3d diagram of where the sound was going to be for the whirling vortex. I mean, it was pretty incredible. Um, and Casey was also great at choreographing the fight stuff. When we were in studio, we'd be like, okay, Casey, you're the conductor. And mm -hmm. he'd be like, okay. And he'd point and that's a punch. There's a kick and just point around to different people. Ah, mm, mm. No, we, we were talking about that. We were like, I, I wonder if like, do they just have Emma stand there and make like, you know, punching noise. Like, <laughs> oh yeah. 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 That's wild. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. The amount of detail and to go the into sound design. Casey, like let me just that. say the other thing about Casey is oh, yes. like everybody else involved. Uh, <laughs> He's multi. He is an absolute mega fan. Um, and He's sometimes good at hiding it and other times really good at hiding it. Um, but yeah, absolutely massive, massive fan. Um, and the only thing that made it better for him was um, at New York Comic Con, we had a dinner, a cast dinner after on Friday night. And, um, and Danny came and Danny hadn't been in the studio with us. And the only thing that Casey loves more than, than Buffy the Vampire's <laughs> I think, is Gilmore Girls. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, I think it almost cost Casey his marriage because his <laughs> wife is an even bigger Gilmore Girls fan and she wasn't there to meet Danny <laughs> um, anyway so the, um, sorry. I had to I had to share that but yeah Casey we, we were very fortunate and it's funny like spilling some tea and that we've told Casey this like when we first met Casey over Zoom we got off the Zoom and and said to each other, oh, man, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to work with this guy because I feel like he doesn't really want us there. Um, and Which was the opposite of of how it was. It, it just out. him trying to put on a front of like, well, no, just... it was it was that, you know, he's used to he has worked with people before who, um, uh, you know, he views as people who, who aren't familiar with the process that they're that they're doing and maybe don't contribute that much but once we got into the studio the three of us worked together so well and so well. we uh, i'd work with him again anytime I, we loved it he's amazing that and he's mr pickles yeah. ah well. <laughs> <laughs> wow we like we're talking about that we're like i wonder if that's amber doing those munchy noises that'd be really funny <laughs> no, that's, that's casey <laughs> that is casey yeah yeah he's mr pickles i love um, that <laughs> We need you to know, see the 3D models. Yeah. So <laughs> no, I'm not gonna lie, Amber. I know you've seen the the very fucking nerdy images I do for the podcast. I did a bunch yeah. of them for Slayers, just like Aww. scenes from like what could have been. Um, I'll send them to y'all after this. But I did some I'm gonna post with this episode as well, and that was just like fun to do. Um, but on the sound design, and I mean this as the biggest compliment for me, this sounded like. And I'm not a big gamer, but I've had roommates who are. It sounded yeah. like the coolest fucking video game. Yeah. Like, that's what it reminded me of. Like, with the music in the background, but you still hear the monsters. Like, they're not too loud, but they're there. And you can, like, picture them. Especially, like, specifically the ghouls coming out when Spike's fighting them. Like, yeah. those noises were so specific, but they were so, like, yeah, of course that's a ghoul. As if that's real. <laughs> but, like, yeah, that makes sense. This is a ghoul noise. We kept uh, saying sounds that like it the Buffy did, universe. Yeah, yeah. Like it sounded well. That's what we kept saying is that it sounded like I'm working on my computer and I have it playing on the TV off, just off, you know, to the side. And it, even especially that first episode, it, it sounded just like an episode. Yeah, and I was working on an audio book when this came out, and it like nearly killed me producing <laughs> an audio book. I have no idea how they pulled this off, but like hats off everybody. The only thing I can compare it to was the Sandman production um, well, with the like yeah. level of, of just sheer effort that went into it. <laughs> no, that's another Audible UK. Like that was sort of they they had done the Sandman, and that was sort of the the litmus test for not litmus, but this was sort of the test for uh, my brain. I'm I'm off coffee. I've been <laughs> off coffee the last week. And my oh, brain does not work tough. anymore. It's yeah. I was, I'm on day recharge. I can't give it up. <laughs> I I give like it that's up. a that's a poor decision, but okay. I know. I know. Um, <laughs> My brain's yeah. all over the place. I just restarted Adderall last week and I have a cold, so I'm on Dayquil. So we're in the same, <laughs> we're in opposites of the same uh, basket. <laughs> so yeah, not litmus test. That is a totally different thing. Is but they were, That was the test of like, do these, do these audio plays or audio dramas really work? 
And I think Sandman did a beautiful job of that. And we built on that. We wanted to do what they were doing and add even more. Um, and I think that's that Dolby Atmos stuff that is that if you listen to it in that world, um, in the like the, the work is is incredible that Casey did and his team. They they're just they're brilliant. I cannot yeah just say enough how talented that whole group just beautiful. And the work. cast, man. I like oh yeah. You know, the first day that, that Charisma was sick the day before she was supposed to come in. Uh, so the, she was in a booth, soundproof, a sound booth the first day by herself. Uh, and then James got sick. James was in a booth for a good part. You know, he could see everybody, but um, uh, but he was in a booth the whole time. And, and it was great because he's like, oh, this is going to sound like crap, but I want to be here for the cast. I want to give them my performance so that we can work off of each other and, and all this stuff and lay it down and, and just the dedication, the effort um, that everybody showed, like Emma is just a superhuman being, oh, uh, you know? Uh, and when she came out with that pup Yanka voice, it changed my life forever. <laughs> um you know, and we don't we don't talk. Uh, we haven't talked about Leia, which we should talk about Leia, our new Slay, the Leia the Slayer, and um, and also like guys, uh, if you didn't fall at least a little bit in love with Clem, then we didn't do our job right. Yeah, oh, from the from the first moment we heard him, yes, yeah. perfect Clem, perfect Clem. The writing for Clem was so tight, so delicious. It really made the whole thing for me. And I keep saying that about different stuff, but it really, really did because it was like. This is what the show does well. It takes a character that you kind of know, he's kind of around a little bit, you learn little tidbits. And then eventually, this happened with Tara. Eventually it's like a main character that like I have all these emotions I've cried about. You know, <laughs> yeah. like it It really, yeah. that was such an important part of it. And, and in addition, I actually was just gonna bring up Indira and say, in addition, that could have gone wrong so easily. I have seen yeah. the like upstart sort of scrappy do kind of energy go wrong, <laughs> especially in a reboot where it's like, especially where they're like a fan of the previous thing. It just, it can get yeah. cloying and annoying. It did not. Yeah. I love this Slayer. It's I love her story. And I want to know like what went into it that you guys were like, this is who this character has to be. Um, And like what, you know, what did your, your actress bring to it and stuff? Because it really... It was a tough thing to pull off that you really yeah. pulled off. Yeah. She was like, Indira was the perfect character to, to sort of, we were talking about info dumps. Like as, as, as a novelist, Chris and I are both like very familiar with the info <laughs> dump moments where you're like, I have all this information, but now I'm just going to like drop it in like a, you know, two page, like little thing of like, here's all the information you need. And it's boring and everybody hates it. And it's, <laughs> But it's they're always necessary, these sort of info dumpy moments. And I think uh, having this Indira character who is fresh eyes, she can take us in. She knows about the mythology and she can talk about it. And it it made it so that anybody who was unfamiliar with the Buffy universe at all could go in and listen to Slayers and be sort of informed because she's yeah. she is giving you all the information in a in a like very pleasurable way because. She's, Leia is incredible. She is a movie star. Like that kid yeah. is just, I say kid, that woman is, she's brilliant. She is like so young and so wise and her performance is incredible. And it's really funny because when Casey uh, mentioned her, I just assumed he had worked with her before the way he was talking about her in these like glowing terms. And only later did I find out, no, he doesn't know her at all. It was a total cold call get. Um, he had played a video game, the video game that she won a BAFTA for, I think, mm -hmm. um, and just thought she'd be great Audible. for the part. Yeah. I love so, that. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, oh, this is this this person that Casey's worked with a bunch, the way he's talking about. It. Nope. Nope. We just got we just got really lucky. <laughs> just sitting in a gaming chair hearing yeah, the voice. Yeah. Like, that's the Slayer. Yeah. That's, that's the new that's Slayer. Her. So we got, we, got, her. we got so lucky with Leia. Um, she's an incredibly talented uh, young woman and it's and it's the the energy the charisma no pun intended the you know <laughs> the, there's so much and um and the, with the character I have to tell you I have an opinion about why it works uh, as yeah. opposed to becoming cloying or whatever and and it works because even though she's a massive fan you know my daughter's just my daughter just turned 21 so she's only a little bit older than Leia is in this and um 
The reason I think that Indira works is because she's she worships the ground they all walk on. At the same time, she has no problem calling them out on their bullshit. And she has no problem like mocking them. One of my favorite <laughs> scenes is where she she gets Giles to realize that the reason he was probably chosen to be Buffy Slayer to begin with is because the Watchers Council thought that he was expendable because he had been so much trouble himself. Yeah. They were like, well, if anybody's going to deal with this, you know, girl who's a who's difficult, let's send this guy because he probably can do it. But if he can't and he, and he dies, you know, she well, it's, so it's like it's her. She's able to bring a unique perspective that feels like the conversations that fans have all the time. Well, and yeah, speaking of say, her being, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, do you want to go ahead? I was just going to say, like, I. I, I talk about this in the podcast a lot and it's probably a form of mental illness. So, but <laughs> I think a lot, like what would Buffy do? What would these characters do? Like the characters that I relate to the most are the female characters, but it's because I feel in some ways they're the strongest characters and they're the characters who are the most engaged over the course of the series, both series and now Slayers with like, what is really the right and wrong thing to do here? Not like what I want or what I need to achieve. Like, what makes me a bad person? What, what do, what, what, how selfish can I be? And I think what's interesting is that like, this is a character who's similar to the fans have spent years, has spent years asking, like, if I was a slayer, what would I do? If I was a witch, exactly. what changes would I feel empowered to make? Yes. And like, yes. I think what really hit for me was like, it, at the end of Buffy, it was like, there's this network, right? Like of like women or queer people or whatever metaphor you want to see that can all decide to stand up and be leaders. And you have a network together. Like it's sort of like a call for unionization, which I also love. Yeah. But the Indira thing to me felt like an, a, a, the opposite sort of like a pullback in not in a bad way, in a way that's like, sometimes you find home with just one person. You don't need like a whole scary network. Like a, a business is not going to be your home. A professional network is not going to be your home. Like one person can be yeah. your home. And to me, having Indira be like this figure that, kind of counterbalances the what we saw as the result of like the Buffy story means that like it's got fresh places to go and I wonder if you guys thought about like you know Cordelia can't be like Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Faith or whoever like they have to be really different and I wonder like you know going forward is there areas that you want to explore about like the idea of being chosen or there or are there ideas you want to explore that aren't about that like maybe being chosen is just something that happened. And like, like, I wonder how much of those concepts are, you feel like are, are fruitful going forward with, with that character specifically. Do you want to? No, so, I, I mean, I, I know Chris has thoughts on this, so. Yeah. I mean, from, from my perspective, I just want to talk for a minute about Cordelia. This Cordelia to me, like, so the thing is, like, look, I love the character of Buffy. I wrote her as much as anybody. I mean, I wrote, what, 13 novels, two video games, a gazillion comics and other things. Love the character. But but Buffy is a character who is very often in her own head uh, in the sense that, like, she'll go off and do something that is not taking into consideration all the repercussions you know, sometimes there, sometimes she can make really selfish decisions. And, and our Cordelia is sort of the opposite of that in a way. Yeah. She's a character who is, um, who has suffered terrible loss, like in, in a way that just will has scarred her forever. And, and, you know, has lost a lot of friends and is holding the ones that she still has very close, but she's, I hate to use the word, uh, she has a sort of military mindset in many ways, you know, um, because she's just looking at it like what needs to be done. Um, she's a survivor. I think, comes a across. Survivor. I think military survivor. mindset is perfect, actually. Yeah, what yeah. has to happen. And I think, you know, um, a million years ago in one of the Buffy novels, I wrote the line, and I don't usually quote myself or remember anything I wrote, but <laughs> yeah. it always stayed with me, which is... Um, uh, a hero is someone who does what must be done and needs no other reason. They don't need another reason to do it other than it needs to happen. And I feel like that's Cordelia in so many ways, right? And so when we, when she and Indira meet, uh, there is an immediate 
like, yes, it's a sort of sororal bond, but there's also definitely a sort of mother daughter relationship going on there um, because of all the things each one of them has lost. Um, and it's sort of like both of them have this, I didn't know I needed you until now. Like I didn't know I needed this in my life, but now I really realize that I do. Um, and I think Slayers have, has a lot of that with a lot of the characters, but anyway. Chris, real quick, I wanted to, I saw that you were tweeting about the Marvels earlier. Cause I was like, Ooh, if Chris and uh, if Chris likes me, I'm going to ask him on for some Marvel stuff because we cover <laughs> all the Marvel movies. Um, and I was thinking about Kamala Khan in relation to Indira. And I feel like both are such good examples of what you said, where it's like, they are fans, but they are still like Kamala learns that, you know, meeting your idols isn't always, you know, the best thing. Like she gets, she calls Carol on her bullshit in that movie. She makes mm -hmm. Carol hug um, Monica. And that's for me, such a tender moment to watch the teen of the group kind of be the emotionally mature adult in the room. And you do that yeah. a lot with Indira. And I love that. Like, I think, yeah. I think that shows like a, a, like a level of care with writing a teen because right. Sometimes people can, when people don't have the care, sometimes it's like, oh, the teen's just annoying and stupid, right? Like, yeah. it's so easy for someone to write. The same way it's easy for someone to write a character like Cordelia to just be, like, mean, who just likes fashion and nothing else. But, like, well, when you bring care, there's more, right? Right. Every character uh, needs to have a reason to be there. Yeah. Especially when you're paying them a lot of money to be in the room. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, the, the difference I would say between Indira and Kamala is that um, many of the things that, that Kamala Khan says, she says because she or she has no filter and her thoughts just come out uh, unintentionally. And, and Indira is very intentional about calling people on their bullshit. Mm, yes. um, and I think it's because of the way she grew up. Anyway, well, I was about to say, it's probably one has the like family life and one does not. Yeah. So one yeah. is a little bit like has to be tougher. Right. Amber, have you, do you also watch Marvel things? I didn't, I assumed that it wouldn't be your cup of tea. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, fair. <laughs> I've seen a few things here and there. That's fair, I'm that's fair. Big... I feel you, that's where I am. Zach is the same <laughs> way, yeah. I watched WandaVision. Yeah, that was I did, I watched that too. I watched that for Emma. I was like, <laughs> yes. Caulfield's on and I'm watching it. <laughs> uh, but that is like a brilliant- I think we should talk about a... the, uh, the, the new theme by Mike Sawitzki. Oh yeah, it's <laughs> fucking fantastic! Mm. Like, yeah, Aww, yay! Yeah. We really wanted to have something that showed everybody right from the get go that this is not this is not your mother's Buffy, <laughs> um, not your grandma's Buffy. Um, grandma, and, don't and, push it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> grandma's right here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's, grandma's me. Um, um, yeah, so so uh, I think that that was why we wanted to like reboot the theme and have it be a little different. Um, and we pulled a little bait and switch, started it up off pretty 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 normal, and then totally Billy Eilished it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, this version is like the the parallel world that we're going into. This version is a little darker and a little sexier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, like I think that. it's a. I was so excited when Audible sent me like assets. They sent me that music file and I've like listened to it. I've been like putting it on playlists and listening to it Aww. randomly. It's like, it's so fucking good. And it's like a complete song. Um, so I guess I would be curious. Did you two have any input with doing that? Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, not just because I live with the person who did that. Um. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no, Mike is uh, Mike, a lot Mike. of talent in one house. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I, will, I will tell him you said that. Uh, yeah. Mike Sawitsky is my, my partner and okay. um, he is also a member of uh, the band, the eels and another band called dispatch. And he's a, he's a producer. He produces, uh, he produced one of dispatch or a bunch of dispatches albums and He's a composer. Love dispatch. Woohoo! Yeah, yeah, they're lovely, lovely and guys. And, and he's an incredible guy. <clears throat> and and, and, uh, and he and and I gave exactly the wrong suggestions for the theme. <laughs> and Mike was smart enough to to basically say that's dumb. Let's not do that. Eh, no, <laughs> um, dumb, dumb wasn't the word. I think we wanted it, we we wanted. I, 
from talking about it, Chris and I wanted something that felt different. Um, but how, how you do that, you can do it. You can do that in multiple ways. And I think this way felt like you said, a little darker and a little sexier, which I, I think our world is. Yeah. The I shadow mean, my, bucket. Yeah. yeah. The shadow pocket. I mean, come on. Zach, like when... Zach loved the shadow pocket. In case you can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's well, we like also, when... uh, yes, there was a lot of, there was a lot going on in that shadow pocket. <laughs> and, um, but there was also a lot going on, uh, in the studio during that scene and also during several of the scenes with Amber and Juliet Landau. Oh my God. Um, Please tell. That, yes. I really it's, want it's, to that. It's Please. really, it's unfair to be in a room with Juliet because she's so amazing. <laughs> that woman is incredible. Um, but you look across, you're in this room and you look across and she's looking at you with those Drusilla hungry <laughs> eyes. <laughs> Holy my God. Um, you start to sweat a little bit. It's, it's, it's very intoxicating. I will say, like, I got a little, I got a little uh, nervous, <laughs> little, little verklempt. Uh, um, and everybody yeah. in the room, there would, there would be this moment they'd finish a take, and there'd be like a second or two of silence, <laughs> and then there'd be that nervous laughter from everybody who's in the room. Like that was a little hot, and we're we're not okay. Um, <laughs> no, and then and then like she and uh, she and James have the same like the the Drusilla spike. Like I mean that I. That is insane. That that chemistry. They just are on that fire. aching, yes. the aching voices and the chemistry between the two of them is madness. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And of course, we've had we've had lots and lots of of feedback for from people who are like, <laughs> "What's going on with Spike and Cordelia?" <laughs> I I will say I loved. So we're talking spoilers. I loved where you left it of. Cordy being like, don't flirt with me. And him being like, well, you're hot, but okay, I get it. Like, I, I appreciate that so much that it, cause it's, again, would have been easy to be like, oh, they're both hot. Yeah. They're going to hook up, you yeah. know? And I would have gotten it, but I think I liked it better, way better where you, where y'all left it of, yeah, they're a little flirty, but that's it. It's not, you know, she's not interested in him. He probably would be if she pursued him. I'm mm -hmm. not saying Spike would say no, but where we leave it Spike is like, has a, we're good. Spike has a type. Let's yeah, say, yeah, yeah, and she fits yeah, into the yeah, type at yeah. this point. But I think it's I'm, good that we didn't immediately go there. Like we, yes. we got some sense of like, yes, this would probably start happening. But both of those are characters that like developed stuff like that over time. Yeah. Well, let's just say again, we're hoping for another season, uh, and we're not going to tell you what our plans are. <laughs> um, but but it's but our plans are not straightforward. So it's, you know. Perfect. We don't like straight over here. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, so, that, oh, that, that's yeah. also something that I think it was really important to to myself and to Chris is that this is the the world, it's 20, 2023 right now in our world, but in their world, it's only 10 years, but like it's still enough that like the world I live in is a very diverse world where there there are all kinds of interesting people who are not just, you know, heteronormative white people yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> well and as vampires spike and drusilla they're vampires who've been around forever yeah. there's you know heteronormative is just not a thing for them right and so exactly exactly uh, and, and it's just everything all of their dialogue together by the way is like just brilliant you don't even have to have <laughs> them talking about their past and just their voice acting the dialogue and all their entire history comes through with just a couple exchanges was that difficult? Did you have to like with them or at all? I mean, the two of them are so freaking good. It's wild that I have to remind myself that those aren't their real like speaking voices. I know, I know. Did it like it's a little I, jarring when you? Yeah, <laughs> you hear those I always remember like forever ago when Jillian Anderson came back to the X Files and she said she had trouble getting back into Scully because she was so different actually in person. Yeah. And Scully was, did any of you, like, I think of the two of them come to mind first with like getting back into those accents they did 20 years ago, but did any of you have trouble? Like, did it take a while? Did it take a while for you to get back into like the chemistry or anything? Especially in a new recording dynamic. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're on set and you're like, well, yeah. I'll kind of get back into the mindset because I'll see the house or I'll see the magic box. I think we 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 made it a lot easier for people because the majority of of the characters were were from other alternate universe from an alternate universe. So if there were discrepancies, it didn't matter because these were not Fair. the characters that. So I think that was actually very helpful. 
But I think there was some worry, like, is James going to be able to be Spike again? And Chris and I are like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah. I, I, James no loves worry. doing that Spike voice. He's done a few yeah, videos I have for no my worries. podcast. Yeah. And he is always so nice. He does a Spike. I would never ask someone Aww. to do the voice. But I've been like, oh, do you mind recording this? And he's like, I'll do it in Spike's voice. And just oh. because he <laughs> feels like doing it. I that, that James has probably dropped into the Spike voice on every panel he's ever been <laughs> yeah. on at some point. That's, I mean, I'm just like, I'm guessing. Not, thought, I mean, not even waiting. thinking about it, but not even thinking about it. I think yeah. it's right. just such a part of him. It's um, yeah, who among eight. us? If, if I could do that. <laughs> it's and like, not it's only like when... that, though, y'all got him to, to obviously have to do the voice, right? But y'all got him to sing <laughs> a little bit from Once More with Feeling. The gay okay. gasp I let you out. could have ended it there. You could have ended the series there, collected an easy check, and we'd all been happy. <laughs> <laughs> try, tr yeah, that was that was trying to get all the rights. Because you would think, oh, this is all part of the same thing. But it's actually oh. a different kind of right to get that. Like, there were a lot of things that we had to, like, fight to make sure. Because it wasn't part of what we could. It wasn't part of the sandbox we were playing in. So you'd be like, okay, so who do we have to talk to in order to get them to be able to sing that bit and then i, I appreciate you for taking the effort to yes do that to yes i i always think about zach and i just for um our horror podcast my bloody judy interviewed the showrunner of um the horrors of dolores roach of course uh, yeah. uh dara resnick super great super wonderful and she actually was telling us just to even have jamie lee curtis's name on a billboard they had to like get the rights to be able to say her name and like i didn't realize how much of that goes into things like that There's i so that's much. wild yeah yeah yeah. It's a, it's a process, are, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a long process. Um, but also, uh, you know, we have, we, we did have some interesting stuff with charisma where, you know, she, she was playing a version of Cordelia that was not familiar to her. So I think that like, she was sort of focused on figuring out what this yeah. new Cordelia was supposed to be. Oh. Uh, yeah. And so, so that was interesting. But as far as people falling yeah. back into, um, you know, Emma did it in the moment. She was like, yeah. you know, like trying to find the voice of Anyanka, trying to find the voice of Anya. Yeah. Um, what about you, Amber? Like we never talked about it. I mean, it was, you had to do three different Taras. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, it just, I think I, I didn't have time to think about it quite frankly. Mm. <laughs> we were, we're we're like i would be behind the the thing the the table with casey and chris while we're directing and then it'd be like okay we're doing a scene with tara and i just go running over there <laughs> i didn't have time to think about anything and just did it and then i come running back over to the table to move on to the next scene um and thank god chris and casey were there to make sure that i sounded functional um <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I just, it was so, it was so, it was so bananas. Like what we did was so bananas. Was make sure so you're standing there just throwing different terror voices. <laughs> yeah. all in that's, the, literally like, that's what she food. had to do. And that's, yeah. that's what Emma had to do. Yep. And, and like, sometimes you're acting against yourself. You yep. had to do like three different voices at the same time, <laughs> yep. basically. Yep. But it was also like, you know, basically the only, the only times that we had any, any notes for you would be like, I'd be like, okay, on the, on the evil queen scale, come down from eleven yeah. to like an eight. Yeah, <laughs> you know, evil like queen, evil queen's two. fun. I mean, but we evil. were still, in, yeah, we were still in the throes of COVID, so we were getting there super early to test. Everybody mm. had to test. Mm. You know, it was still like some distancing stuff, and like a lot of times we ate outside at the studio. I mean, it was it, we were definitely still in it and so that made things really bananas on top of just everyone was we, we what we had five days in the studio chris uh was, was it only four five? four or five no or it was definitely it was at least five maybe five to seven we we didn't have a lot of time in the studio <laughs> five was, to seven for the whole the whole season yeah or? oh yeah yeah yeah, <sighs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's so, the crazy well but but i will say that like a lot of the extras and stuff were recorded separately but for the main cast it was I, it might have been wild. seven full like seven days because was it? I feel like it was monday through friday and then monday and tuesday the following week but i could be wrong yeah maybe, maybe no you're right i think it's seven days that means it's not even days. a full day for an episode nope yeah what there's nine yeah. episodes yeah, that's wild nope. and again yeah. again kudos to casey because he had created an extraordinary guide 
So he had already worked out, you know, so that we could make sure that people didn't have to sit around for, for a day waiting for their scenes. He had broken it up because the whole thing was recorded out of order, um, which was and fun. People, people's schedules. I mean, you yeah. know, Charisma and, and James had just been at a convention. And so like we're sort of trying, trying to work it around so that they came back and had a moment to like Breathe. get functional. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just everyone's schedules were bananas and trying to get it all done in this short amount of time. And then, you know, we did do some, ex you know, like Chris was saying, there were extra things that we did. Like we recorded Danny on his own in, in New York, you know, we recorded Juno Dawson in the UK and Tony, a lot of his stuff was not with everybody. We, we had a full day of recording with him. Yep. And the stuff he did with Fina, we recorded on a separate yeah. day. Yeah, he and Fina, all of their stuff was a totally separate, separate record. So they, we, they were little like, couple of hours here a couple of hours there leading up to the big record um and then we had two days of of uh loop group which was everybody coming in and doing all the monsters and all the ancillary voices and all of the like anything that that like that is in there that is not one of the the main cast um and they were incredible they were so good we we got so lucky with such a good good group of people in fact ali costa uh, who introduced Chris and I is uh, she actually came in and did a bunch of voices and my friend Amanda Troop, who's a, a big loop grouper came in and like, just, just killed it. Um, no, we were really, really lucky. We had such a good group all the so, way around. So you mentioned bringing back Olivia. I, I'm curious what went into that because we all loved, loved that surprise and Died. loved- Threw my phone across the room. We we <laughs> like talked about what that wedding would have looked like. We were like, well, what would that wedding have looked like? <laughs> like who would have been invited? Who wouldn't have been invited? Have, have you met Fina? Mm -mm. Fina is fabulous. I've done a couple of conventions with her in the UK and she is just so much fun. Such a like, just like over the top, fabulous, just- <laughs> just awesome so both of us were like well how do we include fina in this we just adore her so you're saying i gotta get her on the podcast that's what she's you, you really should, should. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she is you, you you do not know what's gonna come next <laughs> well and again it's also like look uh giles deserves his happy ending he does yeah. if any man from that show deserves oh a happy my God. ending, it is yes. giles. <laughs> right. he has been hit on the head Enough times to retire now. <laughs> so many concussions. CTE. Yeah. One, one of one of yeah. my uh one of our regulars who hasn't been on in a while, Meg Ellison. She's a writer. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of her. She writes like sci-fi fantasy yep. novels. She wrote a piece for I think it was Sci-Fi Wire about how like Giles is the only like non-toxic man like that she ever saw on TV in general. And like coming from Buffy was wild. And like how like he was like a father figure to a lot of us. And it really was like we described hearing Giles' voice again was like, oh, dad's back. Like, oh, like it felt yeah. very- Honestly, nice. that's literally how everybody responded when Tony came up on the big screen in the studio. <laughs> he brought his, um, the Mr. Giles nameplate from the library into the studio in London and held it up so that everybody <laughs> could see it. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you could see lovely. everybody like, oh. <laughs> he's just just a, the sweetest such a kind kind human just and good people chris i know that you probably are like a encyclopedia of buffy knowledge the way not as much as you not as much <laughs> as you guys but amber i know like and this isn't it was a i know it was a job for you it was a job that you worked you know and it was a job so i don't always remember i'll have people quote this podcast back to me and i'm like when did I say that? And they're like, oh, remember in like you, when you covered Buffy season two, I'm like, oh God, that was five years ago. I don't remember. Did you need like, and it was fully understandable. If the answer is yes. A refresher. Was there anything that you like didn't remember or anything you had to like get filled in on? Do oh, you yeah. ever watch the show? Is what we're <laughs> That's the question, please. Um, you know, I, I had, I had watched a couple of the first episodes because I actually knew Allison Hannigan pre being on Buffy. And so I'd, I'd watched the, like the first two to be like, oh, Allison's show, I don't, you know, and then I didn't watch it again until uh, I was on the show and they would actually, we would, <laughs> we would go into work and on, I was at the night, whatever day it aired for lunch, they would play that night's episode. So everyone would watch it while we were having lunch. Um, so, so, and yeah, so I watched it in, 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 in 
you know, three, three years worth of it. And in the lunch, you know, cafeteria, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, but I am, I, I, and, and my, my partner, Mike will contest, will, 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 will uh, back me up on this. I'm terrible at details. I am not a detail person. I'm a big picture person. So even things that I just am like obsessed with, I do not remember the details. Oh. I don't remember lyrics to songs. That's I right. make up lyrics to songs to, I, I, I don't know the lyrics to anything. I'm like, Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater, had a wife and could not feed her. Like, we don't need another hero. There we go. That's what I thought it was my whole life. Um, yeah. I just make up, make up shit. Um, so, so even if, even if like, I was like the, the most diehard of Buffy fans, I would still need, I'd be like, well, what was the thing with the thing that they did the thing with? I will um, sometimes have people on this podcast that like trump my knowledge. And I'm like, damn. I'm impressed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. speaking of some of that, like little, a lot of the ties in and like bits of characters and stuff. I have a, I have a kind of a minor question, but also a big question. You brought back <laughs> Amy, which I loved. We needed to see an Amy moment, but for you, was it exciting? Okay. You're part of an iconic couple in TV history, right? Like yes. it, it will forever be. It's yes. in like textbooks. Similar to Spike oh, and Drew, bananas. they had each other though, right? Like they could yeah. lean on that dynamic to get back yeah. to wherever they were with the character. You obviously weren't working with Allison on this project. Yeah. Um, were you excited for the freedom from being Willow and Tara to be the Tara that we all like, that we all got to love over the years? Um, and if so, hmm. was the Amy thing kind of a way to give us some like Amy Tara interaction, which we've all been like, <laughs> kind of craving. Um, well, I'll, I'll uh, hit the Amy part first. First of all, we reached out and, uh, you know, the original Amy is not really an actor anymore. I think she's a mom, um, Elizabeth. So um, yeah, we actually reached out to our friend, Jessica Gardner, who is awesome. And we were like, hey, can you... <laughs> can you come be Amy Madison? And she's like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'll come be Amy <laughs> Madison for you. No problem. But Chris and I were like, oh, well, this is our friend Jess, who's super talented, but we don't know like how much she likes Buffy or not. We didn't, we weren't sure. So uh, we had prepared some stuff for her just so she would know what Amy, she came and she'd already done all the research. She knew everything. She was like, she was like, oh, you're piffling little research i've like gone into a deep dive down the amy madison rabbit hole and had all of it ready to go so just just she knocked nailed it, it out of the park she totally nailed she it was, um i had to look up to make sure it was i was like is that her i'm not sure if that when is she them. finished in the studio i looked at her and i was like that was amazing and jess just <laughs> looks over at me and goes i'm an actress <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, something yeah. Ryan would that's do. That's the something Amy, Ryan well, that's, the, that's like the Amy she, confidence. She killed it. I mean, she was so perfect. And she was just like, oh, of, of, I got this. What do you, she was just blowing it off completely. Um, <laughs> well, Amber, before you, you go back to the larger part of that question, yes. uh, I want to say that I was thrilled to, to I was going to say uncouple in the sense of trains, but that comes out wrong. I was I was able to. Are separate. you going to the naughty place, Chris? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I was, that's where your brain Shadow always goes to the naughty place, Amber. Um, no, I I was thrilled to to detach Tara um, from Willow and Tara. Yeah. To have Tara uh, Tara's story not be defined by her relationship with Willow, and again, that's why I'm so enthusiastic about hopefully being able to continue but continue go ahead sorry um no i mean that relationship is is really special like it's it's an important relationship just um as it is uh, whether it's connected to a show or not like it it is it is it was important and it was it was at a time when you didn't you didn't have that that there weren't there weren't a lot of those relationships on television uh, in, in, in the public consciousness. And so I, you know, like I said, like I've always said, I'm just so honored that I got to participate in that, in that relationship. Um, but for Slayers, we were kind of like, this is a different version of Tara. This is yeah. not the same Tara. So 
if we give her the same things, then we're just rehashing what's already happened. Yeah. And we wanted to do something different with her. We wanted to, to, to try a different sort of like path for, because she's a different Tara. And I didn't, I didn't want to go back over what we'd already done. And Allison wasn't, you know, we weren't, she wasn't part of this Slayers. Willow wasn't a part of this story. So it felt, it felt funny to try and like shoehorn something in without her being there. Um, So yeah, I was, I was excited to sort of take her in a new direction, but to keep the kindness and the goodness that is inherent in that character, whatever universe that she's in, um, to make sure that that was always underneath that when that's where the good Tara voice, like spoilers, abound but the good terror voice was that that good con that 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 like like you were saying that morality that like black and white like what is what is good what is evil how how do how do we how do i stay a good person that was always underneath her even with the darkness that sort of had taken taken her over i wanted very much for that to still be there because so many people are connected to that character and feel the feels for that character and and i wanted to be respectful of that um, but yeah, it was, it was just, if, if it had been in our universe, it would have been, I think we would have had to like address the Willow Terra stuff. I think that it's important and, and it would have been necessary, but because she was a different universe, Terra, it didn't feel right to, to go in that direction. Oh Lord. Could you imagine if you just brought original Terra back just to kill her again? And then I, the, know, yeah, the country yeah, collapses. When, yeah, <laughs> no, I just, it was awful the first time and I don't want to participate yeah. in it. Even I don't I I want to be posthumously away from that you know like I know it's over but like I just want to remove all of it I want to lose the the whole the whole thing and just she's happy she's with yeah. Willow they're living a, their best lives and their Airbnb or sorry their their B and being you know like their their adorable little cottage in Maine somewhere with fifty cats you know doing cats. doing Reiki and like making granola and you know like. That's the world I want for. for I want to go smoke Sarah. weed at that compound. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> right. That sounds perfect. You know, um, li- a little microdosing, like <laughs> you did get to. So new Terra. Speaking of new Terra, dark Terra. Um, this is where this is where the gay enters the chat, right? Um, <laughs> what did y'all picture they were wearing? <laughs> because this is we a conversation we had at the end of every episode. Because you know. We would be like, what do we think this character was wearing? What do we think? That we the like, hair too, talking. please. Yeah. A description Tara of the hair. Is- if you could. clearly got the bulk of the budget on yeah. <laughs> the outfits. Well, the outfits. I, I was going to say, there's like a full boudoir of like sexy lady under things. <laughs> yes. in, in, in black and charcoal. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah. a, maybe a little bit of neon pink here and there for, <laughs> for, for Tara. Um <laughs> That's a spicy day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots of frilly, lacy little, little, little bits. <laughs> <Those> um, <days>. <laughs> <laughs> Some, did you say pasties? <laughs> No, but like, let's let's go with that. Yeah. Like, go with some like, some like some like bicycle, like um, you know, the little the little the things that hang off the bike, the fringe on the edge of the bicycle oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. bars. Do tassels. a little like tassels. Li- little tassels. Thank you. Little little. Yes. Neon pink tassel pasties. Now you're spoiling terrible. season two. <laughs> that's that's why she's, have while she's wear, reading the grim- grimoire. She's just <laughs> yeah. sitting there, you know. Yeah, Drusilla has a dungeon, so just <laughs> run with that. Hell yeah. <laughs> There's some latex involved. <laughs> um, you know, I got really good at getting out of like handcuffs. Um. <laughs> so I'll tell you what I pictured was, um, because I remember, and just because this. You so you've been on the podcast, I think, twice before this. Mm-hmm. I always think of you saying you were haunted by the dress once more with feeling like you yeah. go in your trailer and suddenly really? you're there, there, and you'd be there. like, oh, more shots to pick up for that. Yep. Gorgeous. Yep. And you oh, looked no, great it was, in it. It was, it was awesome, but it would show up just like we'd be working on a totally different uh episode, and all of a sudden I walk in my trailer and the dress is hanging. I'm like, hmm, are we reshooting something from the musical episode? Hmm. So I kept picturing that, but like a dark version. So I was picturing. Oh, like I like black that. Black and like a dark purple and like very bodice. Boob- yeah, like little like like huzzah for the big tipper booby. Yes, like, yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's some what Ren I kept Fair, picturing. <laughs> some Ren Fair boobage and yeah. What about on Yonka? What did y'all picture on Yonka's like entire look to be? Chris, <laughs> I mean, honestly, um, 
I have, I, I, I confess that, uh, you know, Amber has always called me the big hairy lesbian, but clearly I'm not gay enough, um, <laughs> for this conversation. Uh, I really pictured Anyanka mostly just demonic rather than clothed. Okay. I imagine, <laughs> I imagine she probably wasn't naked the whole time. <laughs> no. So, um, I feel like it was like ripped, like like Cinderella peasant like Ooh, attire, all ripped yeah. up and yeah. dirty, blood stained. We were blood we stained, talked we I did think. make Cordelia a vampire slayer too though, so I do want to know again. I'm going to push you. What was Cordelia wearing? <laughs> oh, I feel like she was definitely like like leather based. There's yeah. a lot of leather, like red red leather pants like she's got a little bit of the buffy thing going on there's a, you know i think that 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 slayer leather mystique yeah. kind of it just infiltrates yeah, all you know, the multiverse I, I agree with you but at the same time since since charisma in studio was more into the athleisure uh she was yes i i i kind of <laughs> figure cordelia's wearing like lululemon and ivy park yeah. <laughs> listen you can do a liquid legging with a lululemon top we've all done it before. Ooh, i like that that works and I, I will say i feel comfortable saying this much like with what you said chris charisma even said when she was on the podcast i think i asked her something like what's the difference between you and cordelia and she was like there's not much of a difference between me and cordelia these days <laughs> like, so yeah sure like what charisma is wearing is what cordelia would wear i would go with that as well <laughs> super styling any way you cut it is yeah, um, so real quick as we're wrapping up i just have to ask real quick one more thing about slayers is the ending so again spoilers 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 we have vampire giles and we have willow is are there is that setting up for season two is that something mm -hmm. that we are going to you know um see possibly so so when you write something like this, one of the things that you want to do is um, is plant a lot of seeds without knowing what you're going to be able to water. Fair. Um, and so uh, we, we will have to wait and see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Follow up on that. Similar, but you don't have to answer this because we're, we're all waiting and seeing. Um, the Drusilla of it all has caused a lot of discussion on this podcast, on the subreddit, fan Instagram accounts. Is Drusilla redeemable the way that Spike is? Obviously, they're both sociopaths and Spike had to go get a soul <laughs> in order to be like a human being in some sense. But do we feel that that character could be redeemed or is she just a, the epitome of vampireness? And there's it's hard to separate the like real person. Amber, do you want to? I, I have an answer, but go ahead. Um, we'll see I if we mean, agree. <laughs> I, 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 Amber Benson always feels like everybody for the most part can be redeemed. Um, that's my opinion. And I don't know if it's popular, but it is what I keep saying on this podcast. But I imagine Chris probably feels the other way. Um, my feeling is that if you gave Drusilla a soul, she would be, uh, hospitalized. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree with that. Uh, yes. True. yes. That, oh, yeah. Yeah. Don't do that to her. Because, yeah. let, her let her be bad. Yeah. Yes. If you gave her a soul, there's no question that she's psychotic. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah. she's absolutely like she yeah. loves Spike and she's she loves hard and she's, uh, you know, means all of these things. But if you gave her the ability to feel empathy and responsibility for uh, all of the things that she's done she, she's already psychotic she would be uh in in an institution for the rest of her life <laughs> that is that is fair that is honestly like not even like metaphorically but like literally yeah. she would it would like yeah. We, we yeah saw it happen a little bit with darla like yeah just, on angel yeah. like she just started like cracking a little i mean even just remembering the yeah. things you did when you have empathy for yeah. other people how could you sleep at night you know yeah. like well i'll but, tell you if you want to be know, we love her if we want to be like massive geeks, I will tell you that that in one angel story that I wrote for Dark Horse, um, I I explored this idea. Uh, angel talks about it, and he says the worst thing about having his soul was that he could still remember all of the things he did when he didn't have his soul, and they're good memories. Oh. 
So yeah, that's no. the worst thing is to remember all of these horrifying things and your physical response to the memory mm -hmm. is initially like, oh, that's a happy memory. But wait, I eviscerated that girl. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. And um, you kind of, you guys kind of touch upon that with Anya and Anyanka. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, for sure. That's going to be Tara's next, you know, couple of years is picking yeah. apart what that was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been no, there. for sure. For sure. All the awful things that she did. Yeah. But okay. So we have, I just a little bit. I have some questions that the folks in our Patreon Discord um, asked. I asked everyone if they had any questions. Rapid fire, we'll do quick whatever. Um, the first question is from Trevor Carley. He does, I don't know if either of you have ever seen them. He did our animations for our YouTube videos and he does Lego Buffy animations where he like oh, takes the audio cool. and super cool. Um, he asked, uh, how did the audio format influence your approach to telling the story in the Buffyverse? I mean, it's, it is a very different way of, of telling a story because you have to think in terms of, you know, um, you don't have the visuals, so you have to use, you have to use words and sound effects to explain what is happening, where you are in, 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 in like setting location, what is, what is actually happening physically. Um, so you have to be really mindful of that stuff. And Chris and I had worked on, uh, another, uh, audio, uh, uh, project called the ghost of Albion. So we had a little bit of, of history with that, but still like it really does inform, all right, how many locations, how do we set this location up? How do we make sure everyone understands what's happening? You really do have to think of it in, in, in terms of, 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 of an, um, an auditory, you know, it's, it's, it's an audio story. Mm. So it, yeah, characters it, it, have to say other characters' names more than they do. Yes. If you're being, if you're able to see who they're speaking to, you know, um, so. Troy asked, uh, I need to know everything about Mr. Pickles. Who named him and why? <laughs> <laughs> Chris, do you want to, you want to take on um, the Mr. Pickles of it? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Pickles was definitely mine. Um, <laughs> I didn't know Casey was going to play him at the time, but I'm so <laughs> glad he did because he brought real life and character to Mr. Pickles. Um, you know, the ideal thing is that like, you know, uh, Tara needed, somebody to bounce off she needed somebody to be able to yeah. emote with and speak to so we could communicate things speaking of being audio, audio yeah communicate things that the audience can't see and um and at the same time you know the idea of like so we have witches familiars which they didn't really do uh yeah. much of on the show um but we in, in this world you know anya has yeah. Jasper is her familiar and and Tara has Mr. Pickles. <laughs> I love me some Mr. Pickles. <laughs> I we all love Jasper, I have to say. Um our editor oh. Ashley, she has a little terrier that is white oh. and that's she sent us the picture of her dog in like a little sweater. Um and that's what we all kept picturing throughout the series oh, of for reading. Sure, for yeah, sure. like a little white terrier who's yapping. Um okay, so uh Julian asked did you all get to do everything you wanted to do with this series? Oh, no. We, that's why we want, like, five more seasons. <laughs> <laughs> fair. Fair. We also do. Never, um, we can never be satisfied. <laughs> Hannah asked this for you, Amber. Um, acting, directing, those are collaborative art forms. Well, writing is a solitary one. What skills transfer over between these disciplines? Oh, that's it. Wow. That's a, 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 <laughs> yeah. an interesting question. Um well, writing actually with Chris is very collaborative because it's not just me alone. We're like bouncing stuff off each other, sending each other stuff. I'm going through what he did and making changes and vice versa. And so it is actually writing in this format with somebody else is very collaborative. That's why writer's rooms for TV shows are very similar. It's very collaborative. Um, but I think uh, the skills that you, that you need as an actor, a writer, director, any of those things, you need to be able to listen. <laughs> That's really important. You need to be able to listen and hear, not just not just like take it in, but actually like hear what people are saying because it is these are all collaborative mediums. And so, the ability to 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 synthesize and take in what somebody is telling you and not just like have it go in one ear and out the other is really important. Cool, cool. And Chris, this question is for you from David. He asked if you had a favorite of the Buffy books you wrote from back in the day. Good question. Um. <laughs> Honestly, I think my favorite is uh, is always well. I loved doing the Lost Slayer, which is the uh, serialized novel 
where Giles is the vampire king in the far future. Um, but uh, I think my favorite to write was Spike and Drew Pretty Maids All in a Row, um, which was my World War II <laughs> Spike and Drusilla novel. Oh, God. I love that. I um, You'll appreciate this, Chris. One of the a few years ago, like I want to say like eight years ago or six years ago when I went on, me and my ex went on vacation with my parents and I had met them at their house and we all like flew out of Philly together. And I was still living in New York at the time, but I was like, oh shit, I left my books at home. What books do I have here in my parents' house? And it was all the old Buffy books that you wrote. You and Nancy Aww. Holder's books were on a shelf in my parents' basement. And I was like, well, I guess I'm bringing these. And I brought a bunch of those to reread while on, and I did reread them and they all still held up. So <laughs> thanks. They were really, they were really fun. Really fun. <laughs> I have um, a, a specific time in my life when I could start purchasing Buffy books. And until then, it was me at the <laughs> library. And I eventually worked there. And the entire staff knew that for years, I just had the Buffy books coming in and out, comic books. Like, I was, and then I would do, like, oh, I would have, like, interlibrary loans for the DVDs, blah, blah, blah. And <laughs> I was going through my collection the other day, and it was like, oh, this is the point at which I had disposable income. So, <laughs> and it's all of which to say thank you for years of entertainment. Well, and um, yay libraries. No yes, banning like, books. Hell yeah. We had so many authors on this podcast who are clearly, like, identify LGBTQ that have had their books banned at different so schools stupid. and states. So stupid. It's ridiculous. Oh, listen, that's the reading list. I love uh, I love that Pink just did that. I don't know if you guys saw that uh, Pink has purchased thousands of books from uh, banned book lists for kids. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I, I love, love it. And, um, yeah. Totally. Cool, cool. Well, thank you both for doing this. It's always a pleasure oh, talking to you. Um, One final question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> have you heard from that has given you your snaps either like people in your life other ca former cast members any writers like ha have has the what has the response been like i need to know oh i mean everybody I, it's it's been kind of insane how <laughs> wonderful the response has been like i i also don't go on the social media reddit stuff looking i i just i i don't need I don't need to go down that rabbit hole because for every yeah. lovely comment, there is one that is not lovely. And always. It's it such <laughs> and a that's bummer. the one you remember. Yeah. And it's always the one you remember for the 50 good ones. It's the yeah. one cruddy one. Um, but I've had so many people reach out and tell me congratulations. And, uh, you know, my family, I'm trying to explain to my dad what he's 85, what oh, this yeah. is, where he can <laughs> hear it, how he can hear it. Is it a TV show? What is it again? Um, <laughs> but he's very proud of me. Radio program, Daddy. <laughs> my yeah. my mom would call yeah. it my radio show, oh, and my my dad mom. still fully understand it. Yeah, and I'm sending you love you know, for your mom. Thanks, and, Amber. Um, I appreciate that. I've heard from all kinds of people since since it debuted, um, and that's wonderful. Um, and you know, it's just it's great to hear from them and to have people be excited and have people be proud of you. But um, nothing matters as much as seeing how happy and proud the cast has been. That's nice. Yeah, that uh, is really nice. So, you know, oh, I ha and I have to say, honestly, if, if I'm if we're spilling tea. Um, we are. James Leary brought his sons to New York Comic Con. And they're amazingly like polite, Such kind young kids. men. Uh, yeah. Just such good guys. And to see how proud they were of their dad. Um, that so was nice. everything. Yeah. That yeah, was everything. Was... Yeah. That is so, so nice. And he's so, he's been on too. He's so nice. Oh, such the night. So nice. You know, to see charisma so happy, you know, um, to see Amber exhale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> <laughs> this year's Comic Con was like a victory lap. Like I, I went, yeah. I roller skated because I live on the Upper West Side. I roller Aww. skated my ass all the way down. Took pictures in front of the ads. It was like, <laughs> did you do the the uh, the event? Did you go into the the um the yeah. site? Was that yeah. not incredible? Incredible. Absolutely. What are they? What like, What is it called? It's not. I called the, the event, activation. It, the activation. The activation was incredible at New York Comic Con. They uh, Audible outdid themselves. It was beautiful. What an it was incredible like the Buffy Super Bowl. I was like, this is <laughs> yeah. Insane. This is so really cool. <laughs> well, 
Now I will thank you both. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. I want to tell everyone how nice the two of you were about organizing this. We did it, us, just three of us emailing. And yep. I like, that's, I really appreciate the both of you like taking time to like email with me and set this up and come on oh and God. talk to me. Of course. Um, of course. Thank, thank very you. Very nice. So thank um, you and- guys for listening and for enjoying it. It's, yeah. and the kind things you said, like it, it really like does impact both of us. We feel like we've done something important and special and, and seeing your responses because you guys are, are like the ultimate fans, you know? Well, I hope, I really it. hope I'll take it. Sure. Yeah. Yes. I will take it. I hope you both have felt the love because I'm going to use that as a quote too. I'm going to put that. I'm telling everybody. Amber Benson said, this. Amber Benson said, I am the ultimate Buffy fan. <laughs> when, I, when I have a Slayer Vest 98 ad somewhere, it'll say, you guys are the super fans. Amber Benson. <laughs> we're, we, Ian and I are pretty sure we're going to be in the nursing home together. So it'll just be us screaming from <laughs> our individual rooms at each other. Remember, I mean, rewatching the DVD. <laughs> well, listen, you guys have done some really wonderful work that that has changed my life in a positive way. And then you came back on a on a big white horse to do it again. And it's so great. So we can't wait to see you do it 10 more times and then a movie. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, speaking of, okay, well, we'll get into yeah. like promoting everything, giving everybody, I have to do this just, if anybody just wants to let them, Disney, turn this into an animated show, we'd all be here yeah. for it. We would love it. Yeah. We'd love it. I love Harley Quinn. These things are out there, Invincible. We this, talk about this it. Could, we could have a Buffy verse animated series. I think it's. Well, fun. listen, you know, uh, we have laid the groundwork for uh, the ability to tell all kinds of stories yeah. uh, in this new world. So. All right. I'll well, thank you both. And tell everyone uh, where they can find you. And you have a new novel that is coming out or just came out, Chris, right? Uh, my new novel, The House of Last Resort, will be out in January from St. Martin's Press. And where can they find you on social media and everything? I'm well, I'm I'm all over social media. I'm easy to find. <laughs> fair, fair. Uh Amber, anything you want to promote or have anyone follow you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So as aspirational. The, as the most the easiest, the most easygoing person I've ever interviewed. I knew you were gonna be like, man, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> when, did you ever, did either of you watch the hot ones with Elizabeth Olsen when he's like where can everyone find you and she's like I live in New York and he's like I mean your work that reminded me of you guys. <laughs> that's amazing but alright everyone uh, we will see you next time and thank you both so much thank you all for listening thank you thank bye you. Okay.